myself, Matt Stryker. Welcome. Welcome to Live the Studios. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate it. I got to tell you, man, I, uh, I popped out of my chair when I saw your email. This is, uh, this is a highlight for me. It really, really is. I'm excited. Thank you for even thinking of me. So are you familiar with The Hustler? How can you not be? And maybe we just start right there. You know, how can you not be? I think if you want to make it in the, in the art, in the craft, you've got to get inside the minds of the greats while they're still here. And I think we're fortunate to have that now because social media makes the world tiny. Yeah, I was looking up um, some of your clips. I wanted to just see if you'd been on any shows like this kind of show recently. But I found a, like a real old one. I think it was one that, um, oh, Colt Cabana and those guys were doing. I can't remember if Colt was on that one or not. Uh, kind of a sit down. I mean, this was like eight or nine years ago. And it, you had said something like somebody had asked who knows who like uh, carried the ghetto blaster around or it was a rock, rock and roll buck zoom Hoff reference or whatever. And you were the one like at NXT or wherever you were at at the time that knew and like nobody else knew who it was. So I was like, yeah, he probably knows who Riff is if he knows. I carried a boom box. In I, your I, pants. <laughs> <laughs> is the disco kid you did, right? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Were you ever with uh, Rock and Roll? I always say his last name wrong, I think. Rock and Roll Buck Zuma? Yeah, maybe I said it right then. Were you ever with him anywhere? No. Uh -uh. I just remember watching him on TV. I think he was on with Iceman King Parsons. I feel like they were either together or feuding, one of the two. I can't remember. <laughs> I think that's when What's-His-Face was down in uh, Texas with Iceman Parsons. That's where uh, Parsons was from. Oh, from, oh Texas. yeah, he's from Texas because I was in Portland. That was his first territory. So he came to the uh, uh, the Bomber Hotel where all, all the boys stayed out, where all the rats hung out, 6 to 60, blind, crippled, or crazy, skinny, fat, and you know where it's at. But anyway, we was all uh, – uh, that's where I met the the lovely Pam. And then uh, – oh, anyway, <laughs> as, the, as the Bushwhacker says, mate, she's 14. You know, what the oh, fuck? Oh, I'm going to say it on this show, Rick. Come on. <laughs> so what do you mean she was in a bar smoking cigarettes and drinking beer? <laughs> That's why that was a good rib, wasn't it? Now you you got uh, you're you're from the East Coast, right? Yes, uh, from up in New York. I remember. So I'm a former uh, teacher as well. So I taught for 22 years, and nice. and I was getting into wrestling. I didn't get into like I was 27. So I was training with Nick Dinsmore, Eugene, and then Rip while I was teaching. So we're about the same age. I'm 49. So I remember your kind of story going on at that time because it hit me because I was basically doing the same shit you were doing. Uh, you were you were actually refired. Was that how it went down? Well, the way the New York Union worked it was either resign to keep the license. If you're fired, the license has a mark on it. So I resigned in technical terms, able to keep the license. So you OK, you resigned and kept the license. Did WWE then because you were doing extra work for them, correct? At that time? Yeah, I had just started, um, you know wrestling, uh, teaching, delivering pizza, just figuring out my life. And I had done a few shots for them through a guy named Jim Kettner in Delaware. And that's where I began to learn all the great isms that I think I take away from wrestling that you can apply to real life. And um, one of them was two eyes, two ears, one mouth. I learned that one early. Yeah, so WWE had me as an extra. And then from there, it all kind of just the stars aligned. Got in there with Kurt Angle. And then the next, you mentioned Nick Dinsmore. Got in there with Nick. And then from there, it was all phony wrestling, as you'll say. But it was a wild ride. Yeah, we saw, um, you, I think I was looking uh, somewhere. I saw you you attacked Nick with the dictionary, the big or encyclopedia or dictionary or something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, someone thought it would be clever to wallop him with words. <laughs> he was on here last week. He, he, uh, he jumps in from time to time. So he, he came on, sat down with us for about an hour last week during our show. So he's still doing pretty good. He was on the, on his way to, I think to Oregon or somewhere. I can't remember to, to well, do some well, stuff. Well, he's still on the Dick, the Dick Dinsmore retirement tour, right? Yep. <laughs> he's been on 10 year retirement tour and counting. Well, he had the record for the longest engagement too, till uh, till Bobby Baker broke it. Yeah, ten. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, he broke Bobby. He Baker's. broke Bobby Baker's he, yeah, he record, broke didn't he? Yeah, the uh, world's longest longest engagement. So, <laughs> you were wrestling then. I guess. I guess going back to the uh, getting in trouble as as a teacher, were they cracking down more because they had seen you on TV, or just for the local? They knew you were doing local stuff. I, my impression wow. was they had seen you on TV. But it was maybe even before that. I don't even think they know. 
honestly. Oh, really? I think it was more of a personality clash. I mean, and again, you can't put yourself into someone else's mind. Once you start doing that, I think you get into trouble. But I think there was a personality clash between myself and my supervisor at the time. And once there was something to go on, it just led to this, ooh, I've got him. And then it became sensational. And the lesson I learned was that even if something is minuscule or even if it doesn't even matter, if it's sensational, people will stop and look. And that's pro wrestling. You guys talk about it all the time. You know, you got a guy out there walloping a guy in the face a hundred times. It's not sensational. One shot, whack. And that guy looks over and he's got a little trickle or maybe his eyes a little puffy. Oh boy, it's sensational. Same thing. Yeah, Rip had talked, you know, you'd said that I think it was the Jerry Lawler match, whatever, the 40 times. 60. 60 times and no. Punch Buddy Landell 60 times. That was the finish. But not, no marks. No blood, no swelling, no marking, no nothing. Now he's the, the biggest pussy puncher in the world was Buddy Landell having fucking uh, hands of stone face. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. So, um. So there you were trained, uh, Johnny Rods. Is that right? Did Johnny Rods? Oh, shit. Johnny Rods. He's the guy that saved me from all the guys trying to rib me when I did Allentown and at the old Philadelphia arena in 1977. We're playing pool and everybody's stealing my, I come back and Tony Altimore, he had my, uh, I, had, I had a jock strap then and I had the jock strap and my trunks and boots. It was all over the chandeliers and shit. And some guys coming in was they sort of bullying me, but I didn't know because I didn't know. Well, I didn't know what they was doing. And then uh, Johnny Rod said, "No, leave that motherfucker alone." And they all left him alone. So Johnny Rod's is over with me. There you go. Hell yeah, good. I like it. You got any uh, Johnny Rod stories for us? So the unpredictable <laughs> Johnny Rods. The best part about Johnny, and I think the best part about being trained by guys like you, sir, Rip like Johnny, like the, the, say the, the Larry Sharps of the world, you know, Danny Cage carrying that on. I think what's important is you learn the isms. You get stuck in an office with Johnny. A lot of the guys with whom I, uh -oh. yeah, I did. Johnny taught me, right. even when you know, you don't know. That was the best one. Even when you know, you don't know. I mean, shut your fucking mouth. You don't know. Even if you know a second one, Johnny, Leave them how you found them. There was a guy doing arm drags. He was posting out just a little too far. And, you know, you're going to hyperextend your elbow. A guy's going to land like, oh, yeah, I know. Oh, you know? Okay. Leave them how you found them. So there's a lot of Johnny that you could take with you in life. That's cool. So was, um, was Mike Mondo around there at that time? Mike Mondo was at a school on Long Island, NYWC, where, so I'm from Queens, it's perfectly situated, you can train in Brooklyn, you can train in Long Island, and it's kind of like you learn a different style wherever you go, that's what the territories used to be, so yeah, I trained with Mondo at a different uh, school, NYWC, they produce Zack Ryder, uh, they produce Brian Myers, the list goes on. Myers was who you were on that, that one show, it was, it was Brian Myers, you, I can't remember. It was like Colt, some, somebody else, but it was like a sit down, like in a living room or something. <laughs> okay. That I, I had seen some clips. We do, we do have a chat open. So I'm going to check out the, uh, the chat here a little bit. Oh, it says, um, then I met you in Detroit in 2007 at WrestleMania. I, I was an extra at WrestleMania, but that doesn't mean you would know who I am. I was a nobody. We do have a, a super chat from Jacob. Well, Jacob knew the show. You must've brought a new fan in here for us. That's pretty cool. Wants to know, I don't know, uh, it's not really a question for you specifically. Back in 1995, he wants to know, Rip, was the close fist illegal? Was that always a territory? Like, was it ever? Yeah, yeah years ago. How did that work with the territory? Years ago. Well, it's still illegal, isn't it, technically uh, or not? Uh, uh, a, a lot of territories had, uh, they had different rules. States had different rules. It might be a 10 count, uh, uh, fighting outside the ring and some, and some States were 20, some places, the, the, over the, uh, if you went over on o, over the top, it was a DQ and some places it wasn't, they just had different, different rules. Uh, just like any sport, but the, uh, the punch, the fist is still technically probably illegal. Is it? Well, not? that's like, that's like in England. See, uh, punching a guy was illegal. That's why they had the European uppercuts and there. 
and they would always they'd learn how to shield their punches. So they'd hit you, hit you with the, with the, the pony punch, the pony punch, the pony punch, phony. Then all of a sudden you'd hit him with the real one and knock the guy senseless and they'd count him out. Oh yeah. I think he's asking because the Roman raids and orange cast, they both use that Superman punch as their, their finish. So I guess he's wanting to know why, if it was <clears throat> illegal, can you use that as a finish? I guess. That's great that uh, fans think that way, you know? I think that's the most important thing that wrestlers need to realize is that the fans are thinking even more than, than we are. And they say that the, the marks are in the crowd. No, no, the marks are in the locker room. We're still out there trying to convince them that it's real. Yeah. But with that said, mm -hmm. they're the here. They want to be entertained. Marks are in the ring. Yep. So do either one of you know, this is a Super Chat question as well. Anybody know Curtis Candy? I don't know that name. Curtis. Old school indie wrestler named Curtis Candy. I've never... Never heard of no cool name, but Curtis. Bruiser, but Bruiser Mastino died. Mike Halleck, yeah. he died. He died. But the, re the the good rib was when I took the cane to WCW the first time, and he sat in my car in the back seat the whole time, and he wouldn't even say I'm, I can't move or anything. I just let him sit in the back and see. That I was going to rib him all the way, but he worked in WCW as Bruiser Mastino because they asked what his name was. So as a rib, I said Bruiser Mastino. So there was Kane, Big Glenn Jacobs, and he was Bruiser Mastino. Oh wow! But but then the other Bru Bruiser Mastino died. Fit Finley always called him Chubby Mastino, Chubbo. The original or Kane? Oh, the the original. Oh. Yeah. So he he was about uh. Five foot ten and wore the gimmick boots, so he'd be six foot tall. Uh, and a fit used to just always rib him. He'd make him change the clothes. Chubby, chubby, get get dressed and in. Let me see that one. No, 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 take that off. Let me see. Oh, you, I, I, I don't know. Let me ask my wife here. Which one do you think Chubby should? <laughs> so they would rib Chubby all the time. Ah, poor guy. <laughs> so then you go to uh, the WWE. You weren't there very. I mean, you got signed pretty quick. Then after you made a couple of appearances, right? Yeah, re really fortunate at the end of the day. I really was. To the first thing you get to do is touch Kurt Angle a couple of times. And then uh, and then I got, like you said, Nikki Dinsmore and stuff. And uh, beyond that, the ability to talk, I think, is what kept me there for almost 10 years. But uh, back to that point of Mark's in the locker room. You walk in the locker room, there's, there's William Regal, there's Dave Finley, there's there's Chris Benoit, and then you look at yourself and you realize really quickly that, yeah, you know, you are a Mark and the Marks are coming in. And these guys have a responsibility because they see it. They got to protect it. I wish I had known that sooner because I had lost sight of a lot of things and started to, I was so excited. I start talking mm -hmm. as I can do. And uh, it was a, it was an experience. Talking in the locker room or outside the locker room to others, spreading things that were happening in the locker room? No, no, no. Just in the locker room, just being, f oh. trying to fit in, trying to be one of the boys when I hadn't earned it there yet. And I think that's something that, you know, it's a great lesson to learn because then I was able, like Rip, you know, Johnny was able to see what the guys were doing to you and said, hey, man, come here. I was able to see when the next guy came in, chatty, 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 pull him aside because I didn't want whatever was going to happen to happen. So, you know, that's how you, you be good and you spread goodness throughout the sport and extend it. So did you have heat in the locker room? With yeah, that? of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not doing it right if you don't. <laughs> I have to look at it that way. Well, uh, I mean, you know? I hear stories about other people. I'm not sure I've heard like any horror stories, you know, with you in them. So maybe I'm out of the loop or maybe they just didn't get that bad and you just had some well, heat that well, wasn't talked about a whole lot. I told my stories and and, and now looking back, being my age and now I'm raising two little kids and stuff and moving on to a different part of my life. I can still, I can tell them with a smile because you have to realize when things are happening to you, that these are tools that you're going to need later on in life. You might not realize it then, but man, oh man, later on in life, you realize the only reason I can do this is because that happened then. Um, yeah. You know, Chris Benoit, one of the first guys is be like, yo, you got to shut up, man. You've got to shut up and uh, out dressing out of the locker room and kind of, taking my lumps verbally, but once we got in between the ropes and stuff, for the most part, no one really took too many shots or at least tried. Now, I don't know if it was A, I'm from Johnny. They might think I'm a shooter or a hooker. B, I rolled with Kurt all the time. I loved doing that, but no one ever really did it in the ring. And to me, that's all. If my performances were for the match, that's fine. In the locker room, if no one's my friend, I'll change in the, in the janitor's closet and I'll get through it. 
but that's what it pretty much was. Yeah, it seems like that's been a it's been a story with with several people. It seems like so. Give us uh, you talk about being kind of a mark or whatever in the locker room. Kurt Angle's your first guy. I mean, what's that like going out there with Kurt and just being able to work with him, wrestle him? I mean, was that give us some some Kurt Kurt Angle feedback? Yeah. So uh, another great ism is uh, tennis is a great game, but you'll never be better than the wall. A lot of guys go out and they try to be the best, be better. I'm going to be the, I'm going to do, man, you just be what's for the match. I'm also a believer in, I'm a faith guy, not a full on thumper, but I believe that if something's going to be, it's going to be something just took over, man. Touching Kurt, touching some of these guys. When I use that term, touching, getting in there with some of these guys, sometimes it's just magic, whether you want it to be or not. And then when you learn how to be magical, you can do that for someone else. So going in there with Kurt, was just magic. It's Bruce Lee used to say, be like water. It was like water. It was everything I ever trained, everything I ever knew. I knew where to be. He would leap. It was just perfect. That's awesome. So where, where did it go from there? Where did you go? Was that, I can't even remember. Was that to try to get a contract or did right. they already say, was that, did they use that deal? So again, you know, faith, the teaching thing happens. I'm hot in the news. I'm yeah, on the independence. Yeah. I come in, I have a couple of good goes with Kurt. Kurt nods to Vince, you know, kid's all right. And then John Laurinaitis gives me a contract uh, July 12th. So I wrestled Kurt the second time, July 11th. It's amazing how you remember these things. Oh, July wow. 12th. Hey, I'm going to sign you. Here you go. And, you know, I'm still at a point where I call my dad. To me, that's what this was all ever about was the bond I had with my dad over wrestling baseball boxing and he you know the ride began and then from there you you establish yourself you have riding partners you have friendships you establish yourself in the ring you build up your your body of work i mean there's a lot that happens after you sign that contract and you're on the road full time not down in developmental how old were you at that time 30 oh were you oh, okay yeah cool yeah so then you said developmental you did end up going to, did you go to HWA? You went somewhere for a little bit, didn't you? Went on down to Deep South. Um, Deep South. And uh, it's so funny because <laughs> John Laurinaita signs me July 12th. Maybe July 19th, they explained to me what's going to happen. By August 1st, I had an apartment in a complex. I was in my car, drove down, slept in my car. The funny story is on the there's a place called South of the Border where you're driving between North and South. And I pulled over there and I slept with a butter knife in the back seat of my car, you know, in case anyone's going to get me. But but shoot the moon, I was going and I was going to make it. And I got to the apartment. It wasn't even furnished yet. I slept on the floor for the first two weeks. The ink wasn't even dry. I didn't have to be there until I think September they wanted me to start. But F that, I was on my way, you know. So yeah, that was Deep South Wrestling. Jody Hamilton, Bill DeMott, Dave Taylor, uh, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, God rest his soul. He came through. It was great. Wow. Who else was down there with you at that time? Uh, mean, guys that went on to, to be were uh, doc, doc gallows was there. Hawkins and Ryder were there. Uh, Miz is there. Miz actually lived right over on the other apartment. Uh, we were all there. Kenny Omega is there. Uh, hmm. gosh, I haven't thought about this in so long. You know, listen, between the, the bumps and, Smoking some pot in college. My memory isn't what it, what it once was. So, Hey, we had a sex therapist on here two weeks ago that smoked a lot of pot, she said, and couldn't remember anything. It happens. That's, that's the best kind. That's the best kind. <laughs> Rip, are you a big pot smoker? No. <laughs> no. Rip doesn't smoke or drink. Tell him, tell him last time you drank, Rip. I, uh, really? Besides, Not the shot you did on the show. I don't, oh, even, I don't even think there was liquor in that. Oh, thing. it was New Year's '86. New Year's. I was in Lexington, Kentucky, and I started posing at this bar, but I was buck ass naked, and the cops pulled me out of there. You know, but I I, I was playing cars and and drinking immense quantities of of vodka with fruit punch. Then all of a sudden, uh, I guess I uh, didn't have it as as good better judgment or or what or maybe i had bad judgment well what the fuck right <laughs> but i hadn't drank since 86 until i had the big shot on uh, the show here that lilas made me drink yeah made him drink a little shot i'm not even sure there was anything in it but he drank it anyway and then cried like a little baby and <laughs> perfect so at the um 
developmental, how long were you uh, down? How long were you down there for? And did you ever go to OVW? Did you ever pass or cross paths with Rip at any of that time? Did you ever have Rip as any kind of trainer? So I, I went down, living down in Deep South, but I'm on the road immediately. So yeah, I'm on the that's... road uh, doing the TVs first, then coming down doing Wednesday practice. And, um, you know, to John Laurinaitis and a few others' credits, they'd say, listen, you know, if you. If you're late or you don't want to go, whatever. But that was never my mindset. I mean, I was down there. I loved wrestling. I had nothing else to do. What am I going to do? Lay in my apartment? No, I'm going to go. Th- I'm going to go there. So uh, th- there was that. And then when I was on the road, even still, I was uh, was going to Deep South. As far as OVW goes, yes, I had an opportunity with Derek Nykirk and Mike Knox to go to OVW. We were going to do uh, some kind of creative that never came through. I was going to be their manager. And I remember we were doing pictures. I did the whole, you know, Jim Cornette on the knees, these two guys behind me with my thumbs. Oh, All wow. I wanted from my OVW experience was those tapes and those liner notes. And I got them. And to me, and I've since, you know, Danny Davis was great. Everything was great. I've since been back there when, when Al's in the office now. Everyone says, oh, I don't know where those tapes are. And if you know the tapes I'm talking about, there's these sets of tapes that they used to use, right, guys? That would, oh, know, out of yeah, context, yeah. you can't tell what they are. But with the liner notes, it's, this is a hot tag. This is a, a heel comeback. And it's fantastic. So that's great about OVW for me. As far as Rip passing, no. We never touched, never passed, because I would have made sure to shake your hand, sir. Yeah. So then you were back. Let, let's go back to WWE. I guess it was E at that time, yeah? The classroom. Was that – whose idea was that? Was that, was that yours? Did you have any input in that? or? Who, who's guys, behind I, that? I, I come in as a baby face. I come in as a fiery baby face. And yeah. I'm still of the ilk of clap your hands, come out and come on, let's go. Yeah. And it, it made Vince nauseated. He <laughs> despised it. And one night, I remember I was in San Francisco staying with, a, with an old friend, as they say. And uh, the, one of the writers called and said, listen, Vince wants to turn you to a heel, but he wants you to keep that smile. Keep smiling. Every time you smile, I want to punch you in the face. I want you to correct people's grammar. I want you to interrupt, like be really annoying. And then Vince turns me heel there. And then I start working with uh, right out the gate, I think is Eugene. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. He's, I mean, I think personally, I just, I love Eugene. I think he's great. I think he's great in the ring. Um, Any comparison with his style and Kurt Angle style? I mean, I just said in my head, it's funny that you asked that, but then I realized that you're you're part of the family. So, you know, it's a great question. You lead it very well. Good for you. Yes, a thousand percent smooth. That's the thing. A lot of stuff can look choppy and a lot of stuff can look too smooth. But when it looks just right, but it feels smooth, that's the similarity. And that's what I look for amongst all of my opponents is just... I, I need to touch you, feel you, smooth. And Nick had that. Kurt has that. And footwork is another big thing. After you get up from something or after you put someone in a place, how do you get to the next spot? It's like playing nine ball, billiards, right? And uh, Nikki Dinsmore has that as well. I can't believe I called him Nikki. My gosh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. You've done that a couple of times, though. Maybe that was a uh, nickname we didn't know about. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right. Hey, if anybody in the chat has a question, especially if you're in green, uh, go ahead and put a question in the uh, in the chat here for Matt Stryker. Did you ever get um, – how tough was it being two Matt Strikers? Was that, did that ever cause you any problems? Not only that, but the other Assuming one was – Assuming you've heard of the other Matt Stryker. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, we came up together. But not only having the same name, he was exponentially better <laughs> than I was. He really – I mean, his matches were just so – wow, I wish I could do that. The difference was maybe just uh, – the color of our trunks or the color of our eyes, whatever it was, I, I got the first shot. And um, I toyed with changing it out of respect. But at the same time, we were kind of like his car was a little ahead of mine. But uh, I got to WWE. And then once from there, I'm like, I can't do anything about it. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, you know, he made uh, he made great gear also, by the way, on top of being a great wrestler. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you had your run up there and then but then you went to the ECW brand, I believe. Right. At yeah. some point in time, and you were still wrestling first there, right? Before you went into your commentary role? Yes. Yeah, so, again, another one of those thankful things. They were rebranding ECW, and Vince had his hands in it. 
and he had mentioned certain people that he thought would thrive there. And I was one of them and the writers came to me and we all developed this kind of like ownership of it. The writing team, the wrestlers, a lot of the ECW stalwarts. So we began creating together. And I think Rip, you can speak to this more than anyone. When, when we create together, that's the best creation. When someone creates for us or we force a creation, it's never going to be good. Yeah, it ain't worth the shit. <laughs> no, because if I, how can I tell you to do something when I don't know what's in your mind? You know, you need to express your idea, and then I'll throw throw something against the wall, see what happens, and and vice versa. But I'm not going to tell you how to do a promo. I'd say always in your own words, whatever your character is. Here's your bullet points we need to hit, and you cannot say. Uh, certain things too much. I cram it down their throat. How about even on, in the like territory days, as far as your character or gimmick or whatever you want to call it, did the like promoter have to say? Did you just come in as Rip Rogers? I know you said like in Japan. I think it was Bob or somebody said yes, do more of that. Yeah, I, well, I did. Did anybody have like total control over what you did when you came in no. to certain places? Uh -uh. They just they they'd want to see see you first to do it live. They just say do a promo on this, then they want to see. Well, this guy is oh, oh this guy's good. This guy ain't worth a shit. So then they'd tell you, says you you're behind. You need to work on that stuff in the car. Talk to all the guys in the car. Practice promos all the time. Look in the mirror and talk every day. That's how you got good. Of course, then all of a sudden you start working different uh, territories. Now they you memorize one one promo that's on nationwide or whatever. Before you say, okay, uh, Tuesday night you're in Louisville against Bill Dundee. Uh, you got a cage match. Okay, you shoot that promo. Next, you're, you're in Evans, you're in Evansville in a uh, uh, Falls Count Anywhere match against Jerry Lawler. Okay, that's Wednesday night there at the Coliseum. So then, boom, you go the next one. The boom, and all of a sudden you're doing. You're doing 10 promos and not even thinking about it. And you're right on the money with each one. Yeah, it's pretty wild. We're going to go to the chat. See if we got a question. Uh, somebody asked, um, Frank's Pickle Barrel asked, great name. Did uh, did you ever work with Brock Lesnar? No, um, not in the ring. I did share a car with Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman once for you about 20 minutes. excited about If that, that makes sense. So they made you drive somewhere? Uh, we didn't drive. The car was parked, but it was an interesting conversation. Oh, I see. You were talked to then. Mm, no, we all were talking, and then we got out laughing. I'm, I'm oh, leading okay. you to water. Oh, okay. Here, I can't make I'm, you drink. There you I go. think I'm following you now. <laughs> yep. took, me a, took me a second. I thought you were in trouble for a second. No, no. I know. You would think, given given the track record, but no. <laughs> yeah, I don't. That That's one guy I would never be disappointed not to have to get in the ring with. For me personally. Like well, what do you do? I mean, what do you do at that at that point? What do you do? I mean, I don't know. Try to be as nice as you can and please don't hurt me, Mr. Lesnar. Okay. That's what I would probably do. <laughs> that might that, that didn't work because you wouldn't be in that point. Now you're at that point. Now you got no choice. <laughs> you got you gotta throw it. Because if you knock him out, you're the king of the world, dude. If you dive his leg, you pop his knee, you're the greatest guy. If not, well, he beat you up because that's what he's supposed to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, people say kayfabe and, and, and all that stuff's dead. But, man, still you watch Lesnar even today on TV. For me personally, I still think it's real. I so, mean, the shit he's been doing to Cody Rhodes lately looks pretty good. That's a great point. People ask me all the time. They say, who, who should I watch? Who should I Watch low key, watch Nick Gage because you walk out of that going, I know this stuff's supposed to be all phony baloney, but those guys hit each other. Same thing with Brock. Like, you can't say what we do is not on the up and up with guys like Brock out there. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, did Matt like his time in 3PW? Todd's yes. other promotion in Philly as well as this must be a, must be a Northeastern here. Yeah. 3PW? You got any uh, stories on 3PW? 3PW is where I, I came into my own. I was allowed, as Rip was saying, I was allowed to just run. Todd Gordon was the promoter. He said, you know, what what are you into? What do you like? I used to do a bunch of impersonations. You know, I spent a lot of time as a kid. I only had one friend. I had four sisters. I had one friend. Like, I was by myself a lot. So talking to myself was a big deal. It ends up paying off. Remember, those things that happen to you are going to pay off. I used to, I got to impersonate 
all the classic wrestlers, Nikolai Volkov, Iron Sheik, the Road Warriors, Ultimate War, all these things. The crowd loved it. I never did a, a tie up. I never did a go behind. I never did an arm bar, but I ran around the arena for 10 minutes while everyone laughed their asses off. 3PW allowed me to explore myself creatively. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I think that's the way to go. So after um, ECW, how did, when did the transition? Let me, well, let me ask this first. Who was probably like your biggest, um, longest, whatever feud? Did you have a feud in WWE that stuck at, yeah. sticks out in your mind or that you worked with the most or enjoyed the most, anything like that? Mostly tied to Eugene, Hacksaw Duggan, and then Tommy Dreamer in the ECW originals, including Rob Van Dam, Sandman. Now, that's mainly how I think I would tie my uh, character arc. So to speak. Cause they put you in that group, right? Like the, was it the new breed or whatever? Like the newer yeah. ECW new guys. They, Yep. Same old story. You know, it's going to work. It's going to work whether it's down in mid South in 1982 or in WWE in 2000, it's same old thing, the new and the old guard and so on and so forth. Disrespecting the business. Or, or, or. Yeah. I got to WrestleMania through it. It was awesome. I got to show my work. So yeah. That's cool. So then what was your transition like then to commentary? Was that, hey, do commentary or you're fired? Or, hey, no. we just need somebody? Uh... In my head, it's, hey, do commentary or you're fired. But it's um, it's Bruce Pritchard, actually, who comes to me August 5th. I always remember these dates. Hey, listen, your name came up in the meeting. And uh, some Joey Styles mentioned you. Vince agreed. Thought you might be good on commentary. Be on cans, headsets at 430 at ringside. We'll give you a shot. Again, let me tell you something. I spent a lot of time by myself playing with action figures. My mother has cassette tapes of me calling matches, play-by-play, -play, color, promos, you name it. Rip, I've been doing this since I'm seven, it looks like. Sit down at that table. Kevin Dunn, Vince McMahon, they all hear me. Takes them two seconds. Like, all right, he, he's at least passionate. Next. Nice. Well, Rip has always told us in every training ever, no matter what, when they ask you, can you do this? Yep. <laughs> yep. Answers I yes. got it. Yep. I can do it. It's like saying when Santino asked him if he could speak Italian. Oh, yeah. See, yep. Yeah. He had two weeks to learn it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I can. Well, he told that story. Remember, they they had, um, he had known like a couple lines or a couple mm -hmm. words or something. And they asked him, they actually had people around the phone, like in the WWE office, and put him like on speaker. And he just knew like that one line, like his grandma used to say or something. I can't remember what it was exactly, but that's like all he knew. So that's what he threw at him. And then he learned it after, after the fact. It's great. Nobody knows yeah. what we called in the back, right? That's why we make a mistake out there. A lot of guys go for it again. Nobody knows that we were supposed to do two arm drags there. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I would say the only person I've ever heard, at least that's not like a, star star where like maybe stone cold says no i don't want to do this was elijah burke when he turned down the the spirit squad gimmick he's the only one that i've ever heard say like no at that level to try to get into the wwe but i wasn't I, there so i don't know, you know? He, he made it so i guess it doesn't doesn't matter so the commentary then i mean that lasted gosh what did you do that for five years six years seven years i mean that was a that was a long run right yeah and what's great about it is, A, now you're, you're on every show. You're in every match. It's not just your, your 9 to 12 minutes out there. You're in every match now, and you're telling stories. And it became fun. And for a while, I was the new flavor. Everyone loved it. I called it like a sport. I, gosh, guys, I can't stand when guys get up there in their promo stance. They think they're so good, yet they're rubbing their hands together or they're swaying side to side. And they call it an industry or in this business. It's a sport. And I called it as such. And for a moment, guys like Sergeant Slaughter and Tony Guerrero, who was still in, back there as producers, they appreciated that authenticity. Uh, and then after a while, that all went away. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go back then and look? Now, now you except the commentary role. Hey, I'm going to do this, do this best I can. Did you start watching old wrestling and, and picking up on old commentary or did you new commentary or just do your own thing? 
I, I, I don't I didn't think I had to go back to watch because the catalog's there. I think true wrestling fans will nod. You, you don't need to go back and watch Tommy Rich Buzz Sawyer. You can picture it right now. I'm talking about in the Omni with the cage and all that. You can picture it if you know what I'm talking about. You don't need to go back and watch it. And you can't, by the way. So that's Well, I, I would just mean more like listen to Lance Russell or listen to Gordon Soley or those kind of things. Right. No, because I don't want to. Here's the thing for today's wrestlers out there. Please. Don't hold yourself up to, to Harley Race, Roddy Piper. You can't. This is the only sport where we can't do that. Look, in baseball, you can hold Shohei Otani up to Babe Ruth because there are numbers. And then you can have a deeper conversation about different pitches and such. In wrestling, you can't. So find a way to define yourself on your merit. And please don't use identity as a crutch. Please do all oh, the first insert identity politics here, wrestler. That's not going to sustain. So yeah. with that said, I can't try to be Lance Russell. I can't try to be Gordon Soley. I just had to be, I was little Matthew into big Matthew. So did you ever think, man, now I'm a like commentary, per, like a commentator, like <laughs> this is not really what I signed up for, but this is cool. I mean, did you ever have any emotions one way or the other? Like, this is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a wrestler or, Hey, I'm going to, I got a job. I love it. I'm going to do the best of my ability. I'm a good talker. You know, my thing is enjoy the ride. If we're yeah. going to see, there's you can choose from the tree of life, you can choose from the tree of knowledge. There's a reason. You can either try to control your life. God bless you, you can try. You're still going to end up in the same ditch that I'm going to end up in, the same ditch, the president, the queen, we're all going to go in the same ditch. It's a ride. So no, I never said to myself, oh, I wish I was doing this. I was like, the paychecks were coming in. I was alive. I was with them, traveling. I was on every show. Fuck yeah. No, that's great, man. Uh, admit that New Jersey has the best pizza. Somebody, no, or Central New I Jersey. I will fight you. Who says that? <laughs> Central New Jersey. Frank no, Sid, barrel ass. No, Sid, stop no. right now. New Park Pizza in Brooklyn, VIP Pizza in Bayside, Queens. Sid, we can enjoy a pizza, but don't don't make it contentious. Charles the Hammer Evans wants to know why I'd be know sure to rock. Huh? I know Charles. The hammer, yeah, he's in. He's in the chat right now. What's up? He wants to know why I'd be scared of Brock Lesnar. I don't why know. he should be? No, why I should be, I guess, or why anybody. Well, Hammer's no. not scared. The of point me. I was making was, if you're in a match and he's going to fight you, obviously, please, sir, don't hurt me. Hasn't worked up until that point. So, you know, I know. I'm just but what's up? I, I remember Charles. Charles was great. Yeah, he comes on. We've had him on here. He, he comes on the show. So. Matt and Rip's thoughts, either or, or or both. I know what Rip's gonna say. So, Orange Cassidy, do you, do you watch the current product that's uh, on TV? AEW, WWE. I guess you could find pretty much anything everywhere these days. But yeah. do you keep up with it? Um, any thoughts on Orange Cassidy? So, um, to the first question, I have two little ones, a three and a half year old and a one and a half year old. So I really watch Thomas yeah. the Train and, and Peppa yeah. Pig. I don't watch anything. I watch baseball because it's my, you know, part of my job. But I don't watch anything. And part and parcel to the fact that it's kind of like if you have a problem, you shouldn't be around something. I don't want to watch it because it would steal away the time. I would want to do it again. I'd have to train. I'd have to work out. It's time I don't have anymore. So I don't watch. Secondly, I've wrestled Orange Cassidy. And uh, on the independence during the time, his his gimmick, his character was entertaining and it worked and everyone knew it was phony ha-ha wrestling. And the match I had or matches I had with him, never was there any credibility to what was being done outside of your normal selling. I understand people might be concerned now that the character is bastardizing wrestling, but how much more can wrestling be bastardized? At this point, it's entertainment. And that's it. Would you like to comment, Rip? Uh, <laughs> he's making a check. Put it that way. Yeah. Everything else, no. Would I do it? Probably. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you got to pay an electric bill. Partial payment maybe, but but still you, you got to do that. But... Uh, Nice. Hey, Johnny Valentine, how many years ago, you know, you thought his matches were really hit you so hard. Sure. So uh, when you got the buffet of life, the buffet of the wrestling show, every match had their comedy matches. Every match had certain uh, violence, gimmick matches, et cetera. 
And that whole, the whole, uh, the whole pie right there drew all the special leads of everybody that wanted to see pro wrestling. But personally, Orange Cassidy, no, thank you. That's that's fair. We got a big pizza uh, discussion in the chat here today. Lenny Pizza in Brooklyn, baby. All right. Still I don't know. Get a bunch of uh, East Coasters in here. What did, Matt, uh, did, uh, what did Matt think of his few matches in Jersey All Pro Wrestling? J-A-P. So coming up on the East Coast for, for young Matt Stryker, there was a, a bevy of places to work. And while it isn't the same as going through the territories in the 70s, it was akin to that because, again, you worked a different style. When I went to J-A-P, that was the first place I went on my own. I drove there on my own. I met up with the SAT there. I didn't know anyone. And I was far from home. And in the Northeast, you have a lot of wrestlers of certain ethnicity. I'll, I'll call it as it is. I was a white boy. And I walked into certain places where white boys don't walk into unless you're either a cop, a drug dealer, or in the wrong place. <laughs> With that said, because the love of wrestling is blind, it didn't matter. What mattered was that we could go, or at least I wasn't the shits. And guys like uh, Dan Moff, Monster Mac, Loki, Homicide, these are names that this white boy is, well, hi, I'm Homicide, nice to, hi, I'm Matthew. You know what I mean? Like, But they yeah. took me in. And yeah, I had to pay my dues. We did shoot Tuesdays where you go down there and they just beat the shit out of you. But that's cool. And uh, it became family. And they're still my family to this day. I can go certain places where you shouldn't be allowed to go because of them. So right. JAP was great. So did you know uh, Mike Bucci, Nova, and sure. Simon Dean back then? Like yep. coming up? You're about Absolutely. the same age. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I'll give you a couple, of, a couple of other names that I trained with that maybe other people don't know. Um, Mason Rage. How about Mason yes, Rage? Yes, Jeff Velacci. How is he? Well, that's uh, it's funny you ask. He's been missing since um, I don't know when. Did, when did we quit Derby City? Like two thousand nine, eight. Well, I've not talked to him, seen him for fifteen last, years. Last no, last I heard, I believe uh, married children, and then I think he and the wife decided wrestling weren't wasn't for them. Right? That wasn't that the last time. Well, he came to OVW. Um, yeah. this was oh eight. I don't know about all the personal stuff, but eventually he went elsewhere and nobody that I know personally that I still am in contact can get a hold of him. Find there, him. there is life out, outside of the game, you know, no, so I've never seen he's him doing on well. media, never been able to talk to him again, but yeah, we were partners for, for a while. Wrestling partners. That is. Wow. Huh. So, yeah. I, <laughs> Not there's anything wrong with that, but I understand. Yeah. So yeah, I haven't talked to him forever. How about Damian Adams? You know, sure. Damian Adams. Sure. Damian Adams, Rap Echoes, and Josh Daniels, myself. Again, when you're in the same area, you see the same faces. And it's funny because you see the same people going up the ladder as you do on the way down. And uh, at the end of the day, coming home to see guys, Damian Adams, Josh Daniels, Rob Echoes, we beat the crap out of each other for years up and down. You, you form a bond. You know, Rip, you know it. You form a bond. You guys, you know it. Uh, Damian Adams became an amazing trainer. Again, about footwork, about positioning, about understanding. This game is a neck up, a lot of it, and then knees down. Everything in between, whatever. Yeah, Rip's done a couple of seminars. Damien was in uh, OVW for for a while under Rip. So Rip's been out there to, to his school a couple of times. I have five times I've been out there. Have you? Mm -hmm. they, I, I say he's the, the world's greatest girl wrestling trainer there is. Yep. He and all, all his good girls, they all get signed. Mm -hmm. And he's good. in now too. Like he's in with the office. He's in with mm -hmm. and they, so they, they, they come he's they come the to him for sure. All right, let's uh let's get this moving moving on here. How did the end come with, with WWE? Was that your choice, their choice? How did that how did that go down? It would never have been my choice. The check <laughs> well, was coming. Do in. Leave. I mean, <laughs> Every week that check came in. Every yeah. week. Uh they had they had me in several different positions. I was there coming up on my third contract. So I was making very, very good, a very good living. And I wasn't doing much. So from a business standpoint, that doesn't make sense. Had they said to me, we need you to do more, I would have said, absolutely. Had they said to me, we're going to pay you less, I would have said, absolutely. But instead, they just <laughs> said, we're not doing anything with you anymore. 
because with what we pay you, we can pay four or five other people. And I couldn't argue with that. So there I was without that income anymore. And uh, that's how it ended abruptly, just like that. That's crazy. I know that happened. So I know you went elsewhere. I know you went to other places. You went to Lucha. I know you, I, you were in um, whatever it was at the time, TNA. You had said just a little bit ago that you don't watch wrestling anymore. Are you not with ML? W, yeah. are you with MLW now? Or? So again, it's it's about full circle. When I first started wrestling, one of the first companies that I cashed a check from was MLW. It was a handwritten okay. check. And it's funny because I had it in my drawer. I found it maybe my fourth year into WWE. I had never cashed it. Oh, really? Nice. And uh, Court Bauer and I are friendly. And he came back. And he said, listen, you know, do you, do you want to call some wrestling? I said, yeah, I think I would as long as it's just calling wrestling. I don't want to drive storyline. I don't want to tell you to tweet. I don't want to promote your main event. Uh, to me, that's the announcers hit me over the head. So I'm promote the main event. I'm watching the show. I know the main event. Please don't tell me a hundred times. I don't want to be that guy. So you are with him. Major League Wrestling, yes. Uh, Joe yeah. Dombrowski does a great job as the play-by-play -play guy. I'm the color guy. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff going on there for sure. How, how often do they run? Do you record every week or... So we just did July show was a, a PLE, or is that what we're calling pay-per-views now, <laughs> on yeah. Fight Plus and also shot for their our YouTube and being sports show. So maybe come back in September and shoot a bulk of shows as well. So they run maybe every, what's that, tri-monthly? So does that want you to get back in the ring? Does that make you want to get the itch to get back in? Uh, Court and I had had the discussion. If I can find a way, my kids are young and I value, time's the one thing we cannot get back. Right, This time yeah. that we're spending together, we can't get it back. I value my I'm time. With you. I got a six and seven year old, so I'm with you on that. You understand, right? Yeah. So the time it takes for me, I got to go to the gym. So that's at least, what, I got about 45 minutes in the gym, takes me a half hour to get, I got to train. There's a difference between running cardio on a treadmill and running the ropes for three minutes. You guys know that. So now there's time. So I don't know if I have the time. Well, I do want to get in because I am a um, former small college baseball player, baseball oh, coach, nice. and gambler. And yeah, gambler. So I really want to get into the uh, – this is a wrestling show that we never talk about wrestling is what we usually say. So Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. So I, I want to get into the other stuff, man. I want to get into the Major League uh, Baseball Network, the, uh, the show that you do, the, the, the gambling, the betting show. Yeah. Now that now I can't remember what it's called. Better what, what what's Better's it called? Better's Eye. Okay, Better's Eye. I was watching some of that. I was watching you um, put together some some parlays to get the plus. Sure. And um, my thing is, I always thought you wanted to get like a single bet, as close to even money as you could. Right. I'm watching your show. You guys are putting together all these to try to get the plus number. It's a show. Okay, all it's right. a show. I got to build to my main event, but you'll always hear me say on parlays, if I'm going two, three legs, I'm not settling for plus 130. I need there to be at least three to one. But the book that we use for that show, it, it's a smart book and it's a sharp book. So you're not going to get that unless you really dig deep and, you know. So how did this gig come about? How'd you get that? Is this a full-time thing for you? How can you balance both of them? You just got enough enough time for both this and major league wrestling, I guess they don't conflict. So Right. Yeah. The way it all works out. And again, it goes back to, you never know uh, to whom you're speaking. You never know who's watching you perform. So remember that, please. I, uh, a f one of the producers for MLB is a huge wrestling fan. Oh, he cool. had come to independent shows, live events, knew of me, heard me on interviews like this and said, if nothing else, he can talk. And I know he likes baseball. Let's give him a call. I was sitting in a, I had my own little dressing room in Impact. I was kicked out of the dressing room in WWE, but I found my own little dressing room in Impact, and I got a call. And Rip, Major League Baseball on the line, hey, do you think you could? And what's the answer, everyone? <laughs> yes, of course I can. And that's exactly how it happened. That's wild. So these, <laughs> how long have you been doing that? This will be our third season. Now, do you only do baseball, like when the baseball season's over? Is this a seasonal position? So for MLB, it's baseball, and then I do football. We were doing hockey for NHL Network, but I haven't been back with them, and I do football for a company called Sports Grid. Oh, really? Yeah. So that'll be that'll be okay. Football's right around the corner, man. So yeah. then um, 
I think the last thing I'd, I'd seen, maybe you'd done, are you still doing anything with like the UFC and stuff like that or MMA? Fight, as as fight is doing a lot of uh, MMA, a lot of boxing. So again, just uh, keeping my tentacles in things that I enjoy, things that I'm passionate about. You became a talker. It's better than being a bumper, don't you think? You became a talker. That's pretty awesome though, man. You know? Yeah. I would think you would have been like a, a English teacher or a speech teacher or yeah, something. Me talk pretty one day. But you were, um, I think I looked up, you were like a history. Was it history? Was that Social your, studies, yeah. Social studies, yeah. It's all nonsense. It's all Crazy. stuff that happened. You know what I mean? God, I taught for 22 years, man. People ask me, do you miss it? And I'm like, never, not at all. So 20 years, so you're vested, you have your pension now, you're living the next half of your life, aren't you? Yeah, I'm not collecting on it yet, but yeah. No, yeah, but I mean, you know, God bless yeah, you, man. Yeah, I'm vested. Good for you. Yeah. I just married a younger girl with with more money than me. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> that's hey, why but, you got Lila's but, but here comes the rest of your life. You know, at the, at the end of the day, I think you've done it right here. 50, 49 is not old, right? You've got your faculties about you. I'm sure you can touch your toes. You can pick up your kids. You can You're eat. Right. You got money in the bank. You can still get high, as they say. And get there you go. Time. Yeah, it's all good, man. I got the, uh, the kids... Uh, in the room next door right now, you know, I, I do got to shut the door when Rip comes. I got to shut their door, shut our door. Only imagine. You know, <laughs> Katie the what the yeah. hell, right? So Rip, Rip's been known to. <laughs> I can't believe we're still on YouTube, tell you the truth, but he's he's tamed down a lot, though. He's he's come down a lot for us on the profanity. I'll go back and watch some of our old shows. Holy shit. It's. I remember uh, counting one time. It was like 80 F-bombs in, in well, one minute or something like that. It, it, it was, you have to understand, we talk about in today's society about how changing culture, right? That's a big thing in the news, changing culture. The culture of a time, you couldn't call a match without swearing, as they say. Oh, yeah, because yeah. you were passionate about it. You were culture about it. Oh, so I'll, I'll hit you with the fucking job. Because if you called it that way, you went out and did it that way. Yeah. So there's a line there. And, and I think in certain places, culture should be accepted. Well, I remember when uh, Rip was on Briscoe and, and JBL show, that's what they were saying. Like in the locker room, that's just how everybody talked. That's how we talk. Because they were trying to kind of warn him on the same thing about coming on there. And Briscoe's like, yeah, I know this is how we talk, but we got to try not to talk that way when we're on YouTube or whatever. So Sure, sure. But I understand. But we're doing we're we're doing all right. So let me spin this around on you here real quick. Uh -oh. Since you and Rip never really cross paths, he's never um, a trainer. Usually people come on and tell like stories of Rip when they, you know, had him in class or at OVW or wrestled him or whatever. Do you have any questions uh, for Rip Rogers? Any anything from the olden days, the territory okay. days, the new days? Okay. I'll put you on the spot and see if you so, have any questions for Rip here. This whole time I've been thinking is that, you know, Rip hasn't been saying much. You know, I keep trying to engage him. And the whole time coming on here, I was saying, I, I get to talk to Rip Rogers. My whole well, career. What I, what I do is I listen. Sure. You've you got such a great story. But every guest we have on here that made the big time or they didn't make the big time, they all got a different story. And it's all fascinating. It's all movie material. And I just sit here and go, wow, I never thought of it that way. I'd like to have been in his shoes for, for just, just five minutes or whatever, right? Everybody's different, and we all get to the end of the rainbow, but everybody's got a different story. Something else happened, and it's just uh, all the different stories of all different guys. It's so different, but it's so entertaining. And then, and then when you look back, you say, man, that guy made it. I'm glad he made it. And, uh, no, the thing about yeah, it is, is you helped him get there no matter what. And, and that's the thing is that you've been an unwitting part of my journey. I mentioned with Nick Dinsmore being my first touch, he would always say when we were putting stuff together, phony wrestling, phony <laughs> wrestling. And I took phony wrestling with me and I put it in my pocket. So now I want to bring it full circle and I'm glad you give me this opportunity. I'm getting chills. Sir, I just turned 49, and I do believe that my career is, has wound down. I'm at a second portion of my life now. I'm a father. I lost my dad a long time ago. What would be your advice for me as I move on away from wrestling? I, I didn't like who I was at the end of my career. Sir, I, I had every 
I'm sure you can imagine every knock on the hotel room door led to another and another. If you get my drift, I don't want that anymore. I want to just be a normal, regular person. Any advice? I'm still trying to get the knocks on the door from the... <laughs> but you know what I mean. Listen, when that hotel room door closes, it's the loneliest sound in the world, isn't it? When you're alone? Oh, no. no. It, 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 you're at peace when you can learn to be alone. When you're happy and you're by yourself, that's what, that's what you need. You can just laugh and just think back and you don't have any stress no matter what. If you can be happy and alone, you're the man. Thank you. Yeah. Shit. This just took a turn, huh? It's like a good match. You see, we got the people. Yeah. <laughs> and we, everybody knows our show's not scripted because we don't do any research. We don't do any. Uh, Why would you? I don't have any questions written down. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool, man. I, I, I put all mine. I mean, I'm, I've never made it to WWE. That's kind of my, my thing or whatever, but. Everything now, like I got young kids, 49, married for the second time. So I, I just put all my shit in my my kids. And yeah, that's where I get my same peace, if you will. Um, I just think it's I think it is weird because I now see other I, I know other guys that have been to the WWE that are now school teachers and things like that. And I just look and I think, man, I just I don't know if I could do that. You're still, though, in the position where you're on TV, you're doing Major League Baseball Network. I, I view that a little bit different. You're still in the entertainment business. So do you want that to wind down as well? So, you know, wow, look at that. You guys answered it for me. You know, you're right. It, it is. It wasn't, I guess it wasn't about leaving wrestling. It's that I'm still entertaining and paying bills and talking about something that I love. And uh, I think what what I, what, what rip and you guys was, was solidified for me is that I am peace at peace where I am with my family and with working with baseball and just accepting. I see a lot of guys that don't want to let it go. You know, I see a lot of guys that are pushing their mid fifties and sixties and they're the gatekeepers of the industry. And I, I think I'm okay with letting it go. So thank you. No, I don't want everything to end. So you guys I kind of put it in perspective for me. I'm happy where I'm at. Hey, so what we do here at the uh, Wrestling with the Rip Rogers show. <laughs> Sex therapist one week. Uh, whatever we just did this week, we, we got all kinds of shit going on. Hey, man, we're not going to keep you any longer. I'm glad you got on here. I, I'm not going to lie. I sent you that message through Twitter. And then, because um, your Twitter's weird. It's like, I mean, I'm going to let you plug all your shit before you go, by the way. But it's like M at or whatever. <laughs> and then uh, I'm like, I don't know if this is really him. I don't know if it's a fake account, a phony account. He said, yeah, I'd love to do the show. I was like, no idea if it's really, but. So I waited until like kind of confirmed again. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and start plugging him. I think it's him. I hope it's him. It seems like it's him. So I wasn't sure. You're still not sure. It I'm sure now. Him. You're you're on here live, baby. I'm, I'm sure now. But no, thanks a lot for coming on here. Really, Thank really you. appreciate it, man. Thank you. And uh, Rip, on behalf of a generation that will retweet your tweets and yet still go out and do the opposite. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for what you do. Sir. Well, the, the thing about it is, is if you see something that's wrong and you know it's wrong, if I tell the young kid this and keep harping on him about it, he might stop it, but he probably won't. But I'll feel better about it because I showed him, you know, no, let's do it the other way around. And in probably 10 years from now, he'll probably have a, try it with an open mind and he'll finally figure it out. There you go. But they was too fucking, they thought they was over and some <laughs> old fucker, he don't know what the fuck's going on. He's only, he's only been in the goddamn business since the seventies, you know, but you know, it ain't his, it's his first County fair. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They, they always had rats. They always had shitty workers. They always had, uh, uh, corrupt promoters and, and it don't get any better than that. <laughs> but it's the business you signed up for. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. business you signed up for hey uh go ahead and plug anything you got where can we uh follow you where can we watch you major league baseball anything yeah. you got man put it uh, out there yeah no I, I i always feel like a stranger in a strange land i'm not promoting anything you know i'm okay. on social media just I, I kind of view the world from a hill i'm on better's eye it's on mlb network and mlb.com every day at like six o'clock sometimes we're on at noon and uh Beyond that, 
I, uh, the one thing you were just saying, Rip, William Regal used to always use this word delusional. So-and-so is delusional. And I think don't be delusional world. I want to leave you with that. Don't be delusional. And another William Regalism is a still tongue keeps a wise head. It means just keep your mouth shut. So. <laughs> I'm going to start falling on better's edge. I hope I hope I win. That's all I can tell you. you you're going to make me a lot of money, right? Uh, second half of the season, you can take totals because the runs are going to be a lot higher. So there you go. All right. Well, the other day, it was like a, a record since yeah, 1894 exactly. with four teams lost, like double-digit yep. scoring runs, the most runs since 1894, yeah. 1896, yeah. something like that. So, hey, great advice, man. Again, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate your time. We're going to see the big gold. And a billfold so swole that I can't get the shit closed. So I money fold and rubber band wrap. And when it pop, bitches sound like a hand clap.